and welcome to episode 14 of Stitched in Sweden. I'm Maria, your host, and you can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as mmonska. The show notes for this episode and previous episodes can be found on the blog, which is stitchedinsweden.blogspot.com. And we also have a Ravelry group, and you can find that by searching Stitched in Sweden in the groups tabs on Ravelry. So welcome. Uh, this week I have some things that happened in Stockholm. So this week in Stockholm, um, some one yarn acquisition, a new pattern release, an announcement of a cowl, cowl, not for a cowl, the announcement of a cowl, and a couple projects that I'm working on, one finished project, some plans for upcoming things, and a little bit of question and answer. So, and I have some spinning, just a little bit, uh, that I'll share right with you as well. So starting out this week in Stockholm, on Wednesday last week, almost overnight it seemed, that all of the trees began to get their leaves, the, uh, the trees started blooming, the trees that have flowers started blooming, but also just the leaves started budding. So everything is a nice, bright spring green now when I look out the window and uh, it's it's really nice because it is still pretty cold here pretty brisk cold during the days and especially at night but it can definitely feel that summer even summer spring though too is on the way and it feels like it's going to be a warmer spring this year than it was last year or at least spring has come earlier Last year my parents visited me in the first week of May, which is next week, and it snowed. And there were, I don't think there were any leaves on the trees, so it will be a little bit different when they visit me this year in the end of June, and uh, but I can definitely mark a difference between last year when they were here at this time and this year. So. I've been enjoying being outside some, and also the cherry blossoms have, the cherry trees have bloomed, and they are, of course, a beautiful, this exact color, actually, uh, slightly pinker, but um, they are lovely, so. Just been enjoying spring in Stockholm. Uh, this week I went to my knit night, which is the Stockholm Night Knitters, and we had a full table. We sit at a long table in a cafe um, in the evenings once every other week and we had 22 knitters there this week with a full table and some people sitting on the ends and everything like that. So we've switched to every other week instead of every three weeks and I think it's, it's really nice because then it doesn't feel like so far between meetings when if you need to miss one for some reason. But also, I think a lot more people have been coming, so it's a lot of fun. Um, Alright, so also this week, I just went to the post office and picked up some Arnie and Carlos. This is the Regia, and this is in the Fall Night colorway, which is color number 03655. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who contacted me last week and uh, told me, gave me some suggestions of where I could find this yarn. Uh, there was a lot of you who, who reached out to me and so that was really helpful because I thought it was sold out everywhere and that I was going to have to wait for a long time. But I was happy to get my hands on this and I think that, I don't know if I will cast these on right away, um, I would really like to do the white heels and toes, as I showed you in a Instagram picture last week. And I don't have uh, any yarn for that, I don't think, but I could pick that up somewhere pretty easily. I think this will be a good project that I might want to start soon-ish, because I will have... It's a good mindless thing for me to do when I'm on the train, for example, and it's a way that 
if I don't have the time to sit down and work on a big project, but I, I want to have something ready and on the go, then I can work on these. So, this, as you probably have all seen, that's what it looks like right up there. And in Europe they come in 250 gram balls. So I've seen some, I think I've seen some larger 100 gram balls of this from the US, but not sure. Maybe I just made that up. So that was the yarn acquisition this week. And um, so of course the exciting news is now uh, the lattice shawl, which is my most recent design, is available on Ravelry. So. Um, you can head over to my Ravelry shop, which you can get to through my personal Ravelry, Ravelry page. Uh, it's Stitched in Sweden Designs. And you can uh, take a look at this shawl. And I would really like to give a huge thank you to my three test knitters who um, worked on this for me and helped me with some um, editing and also just some, you know, kind of, uh, this is a little confusing, I think it would be better this way. So, um, yeah, huge thank you to them, and you can see their finished shawls over on the pattern page for this shawl in the project section. They are posted there, and uh, it's, it's really fun to see how other people have knit them up and how they turned out. So this shawl I knit with, I... Uh, merino single. The colored part here is uh, in the wool barn merino singles in her purple dream colorway and I used 90% of one skein of that which is a fingering weight. Uh, for the border I used uh, Madeline Tosh, Tosh Merino Light in the antler colorway and I used just about half a skein of that so it is about a one and a half skein project and I'll show you what I am using the rest of this for in a little bit but um, I really enjoyed knitting it it's my pattern so I hope I enjoy knitting it but uh, I did have some positive feedback also from the test knitters who said it was a fun project to work on so um, I'm really pleased with how it turned out and you can see how I'm wearing it today is kind of over my shoulders. Uh, I wear it this way if I need a little bit more warmth. So I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt and it's a little bit cold in my apartment today, but not so cold. So I just have this over my shoulders and it's a perfect extra layer when I'm sitting or knitting or working on my computer or something like that. Uh, you can also wear it as a front styled kerchief kind of. Uh, with the triangle point down, and you could see that, that I have some pictures on the pattern page how you can style it in different ways. So I've worn it that way as well, and that works. That works very well. Uh, you can also, of course, wear it over your shoulders with the point going down the back, and it's quite a generous size with one and a half skeins of fingering weight singles. So, uh, and it blocks out really nice with, it has a, a nice drape to it, so it's quite large, uh, which really just adds more possibilities to the ways that you can wear it. So, yeah, that's that. And it is the Lattice Shawl. It is now available on Ravelry, so go ahead and check that out if you're interested. Um, and I might as well just announce the knit along now. I have been contacted by a couple of people who said they would be interested in doing a knit along for this shawl and I thought that that would be really fun especially for those of you who maybe haven't done a shawl with a knitted on border. It's not hard. This is only my second shawl ever with a actually third maybe fourth. <laughs> okay <laughs> it's my I've made a couple of shawls with a knitted on border, I guess, now that I think about it. But it's not hard at all, and I haven't done one in a while, I guess you could say. The Canopy Shawl by Melody has a knitted on border, 
and that's the one that I did most recently. And that's the one I was thinking was my first one, but now that I think about it, I think the Rock Island Shawl by Jared Flood also has a knitted on border. And the Bridgewater, which I actually have right here, this one also had a knitted on border. Like an applied border. Um, but it's pretty easy, and I know that some people are a little hesitant when it comes to knitting on borders, but I've said this before and I'll just say it again, I think they're a really great way to do a border because you have so much more opportunity to try out different lace patterns in the border, and also you don't have to worry about having a stretchy enough bind off because you bind off the stitches as you go rather than all at once, once which requires a stretchier bind off, and you get nice little points. So, um, I was thinking that instead of just limiting it to the lattice shawl, which of course you can do this one, uh, you can also knit along with us and do the Swedish Spring Shawl. I am going to be knitting at least two more of these pretty soon. Here's the Swedish Spring. I've been wearing it a lot. And, uh, um... I know that I will be at least knitting two more of those. I gave Thomas's mom her shawl last week, or this weekend actually, and she really liked it, so I was I was happy about that. Uh, but I will be knitting another one in this gray yarn from the wool barn, which is in the silk sock, and I will be knitting another one in a burgundy color which will be for other people. Uh, anyway, the point of that was to say that I will be starting a knit along and you can knit either the lattice shawl or the Swedish spring shawl and I just thought that would be a good opportunity to provide some support and uh, help in the Ravelry group in case you have any questions along the way, especially like I started saying if you have never knit uh, knitted on border before. But it's nothing to be afraid of at all. It's really quite simple. So, and I hope that I've made it clear enough in the pattern, which I believe that I have, so you shouldn't have any problems with it. Uh, but that knit along will be going from now-ish, so um, I'm going to say that the official start date is May 1st, but if you're working on um, the Swedish spring shawl already, or if you're gonna just, if you just want to start the lettuce directly now, um, then you can start whenever, but I, I would say May 1st will give you a little bit of time to gather some yarn supplies, look through your stash, see what you want to use, and then, uh, we can start. So, around now-ish May 1st, and then I was thinking we would go for five weeks, which is June 5th, well, it's not June 5th, but it will go until June 5th because June 5th is my birthday, and I was thinking that would be perfect, June 5th is a Friday, and then I can close the thread on June 5th, and then when I record on June 8th, which is Monday, and I release the podcast on Tuesday, June 9th, I will announce the winners. So it will be a pretty informal cal knit along. Um, which basically there will be a chatter thread, so if you have any questions, if you need any help with the pattern, that sort of thing, you can pop in there and I will be there to answer questions, but also other people who are knitting it may have already come through some part that you're having a problem with and they might be able to help you as well. And then we will also have a finished object thread, of course, where you can post your finished shells. You can knit as many shawls as you want if you're going to knit more than one shawl in the five or so weeks. That's awesome, and you can post a new post for each shawl that you do. I have, I think about, I think I have a prize lined up so far, one, one prize, and I will um, contribute a prize myself. And of course, if you are interested in donating a prize, um, just let me know. You can send me a
message on Ravelry. That would be a good way to get in contact with me. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I, like I said, will be knitting two more Swedish spring shawls and possibly another lattice shawl. And some of those sort of have deadlines that I would like to get them done soon. So uh, I think it would be fun to have a knit along and uh, just, I don't know, have some encouragement. So like I said, that will be from now till June 5th when I close the uh, finished objects thread. And yeah, so let me know if you want to join or just join. <laughs> okay, so this week I have been working on a couple different projects, a few that you've seen before and one new one. Uh, actually that's not true, just working on one thing. Okay, jumping right in. Um, I was working again on the Nermilinitus? Nermilintu? Nermilintu? Shawl, which is a shawl by Heidi Allender. Uh, this is kind of a boomerang shaped shawl, you could say. Uh, and I need a bit more on this. I'm almost finished, but I didn't quite finish. So I'll show you what I have. This is the shawl. Started on this tip here. And there it is. I'm knitting this in the uh, Volenbein yarn that I received from Sarah of Love Sock Wool. And this is in the Blitzed base. The colorway is Neptunia. And it has some nice bright spring greens and some pretty blues and turquoise and then pops of purple in there as well. And a little bit of cream. Which is why I also incorporated the cream into the lace part. I need to block this, obviously, but I think the lace will open up a bit. And I'm looking forward to that. So, I'm knitting this one with the leftover merino, Tosh Merino White from the shawl border. So if you knit this shawl and you have some leftover from the edge, I really like having incorporating a solid in with the variegated yarn because I think it just calms it down a little bit. Sometimes variegated yarn can be a little bit crazy. Uh, but I really just like having the solid color in there, especially with the lace. I think it gives it kind of a, not a vintage look, but uh, I don't know what it, I don't know what look it's called. <laughs> but I just like the white lace cream color in there with it. So I'm on the last section of the lace part now and I will probably bind off after this but I'm going to check because I I weighed this little ball of leftover uh, when I started the last lace section here I definitely have enough of the this yarn left to do another section I'm not sure if I would have enough to do another section of lace the pattern only calls for three sections but I figure if I have enough yarn, I might as well knit another section. So we will see. And I've just been sewing in my ends sort of as I go. You can see I left some little tails. They've been sewn in, but uh, I will wait till I soak this and kind of spread out the lace part a little bit when I block it. Um, I'll wait till after the shawl is finished and dry and everything before I snip those short. So that, that's fun. I've been working on that in like if Thomas and I are watching a movie or something or if I'm babysitting after the kids go to sleep and I'm too tired to do anything else. I work on that because it's mostly just garter stitch and then with a little section of lace that's interesting for a couple minutes and then back to some garter stitch. So that is my first work in progress this week 
I didn't work at all on my uh, loose top by Mere Stevens, which is the fondly known as the strawberry top. Um, but that's because I finished my other one. Anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about that right now. But I just didn't work on that this week, so. In my little, cute little bag from the wool barn, I have my next project, which you didn't see last week because I started it after I recorded. But this is in the West Yorkshire Spinners 4-ply, signature 4-ply. And it is color number 530. This is the Penny Royale colorway. Which is almost exactly the same color as this. And I think I was sort of inspired to cast this on also because of the cherry blossoms. But this one definitely, okay, even though they're really exactly the same color, <laughs> or exactly the same color, uh, this shawl reminds me more of the cherry blossoms because of the white and pinkish purple um, that are together in it. Anyway, so out of this yarn, I started the Salus socks, which I have talked about a little bit in the past couple weeks, as something that I was going to do. And I am knitting these uh, on US size zero, which is probably a 2.25 millimeter. Needle. Here it is. I'm really happy with how these are coming out. I think it's a pretty, really pretty design. <clears throat> um, the pattern says, it's a free pattern on Ravelry. It's the Sailor's Socks by Julia Reed. And I don't have a sock blocker, so I'll put it on my arm for you. So you can see it hopefully a little better. But there is a little garter stitch in between these kind of, I think they look like tulips. Like from the other way. And a little garter stitch. I did a heel flap and turn there. Uh, the original pattern is worked from the toe up. But I felt like just I just wanted to do top down. And also, personally, I prefer the pattern in this direction rather than in this direction, which is what it would be if it was toe up. I prefer it in this direction because I think it looks like tulips. It's a similar pattern to the monkey socks, if you've ever knit those. I've actually never knit them, but it looks sort of like them. Um, but it's a 64 stitch sock and I'm really enjoying it. So I did a heel flap in the pattern had a different kind of heel, I think. It might have been a short row heel. Pretty sure it was. And I just did a heel turn there. Uh, but yes, I am pleased with how these are knitting up. And they're kind of just, I worked on them more in the beginning of the week, and I worked on them at knit night, but they're kind of just in the background. Not really in the background, I don't know. I'm not speeding through them, we'll just say that. So, like I said, didn't work on the loose pullover strawberry top this week, but I did work on my summer top, which I finished. And... It's right next to me here. Uh, it's a little bit damp still, but I will show you. It has the ends all woven in, but I didn't, haven't clipped them yet because I do that at the end after I soak it, and I did soak it, so I could have clipped the ends, but it's not dry yet, so not totally dry. So I'll just wait till it's really finished. But here it is. I am really happy with how it, the fabric turned out after it was blocked. You may remember me saying that this yarn is a little bit, uh, it's, 
not my favorite yarn to work with because it still has the spinning oil in it from the mill. Uh, and it really doesn't, you don't get the full effect of the yarn until you wash it. Which, that's true of a lot of yarns, but this one particularly because it's really, it is pretty stiff while you're working on it. And it's kind of grabby a little bit. And then when you wash it, it really softens up and it blooms a ton. So I had already blocked the front of this, this top and I was working on the back and when I was seaming them together, it was shocking. Because <laughs> as I'm seaming it, you know, I have like this invisible seam on the side and so you can't see the difference between the front and the back other than that the back wasn't blocked and the front was and it was like night and day. So. Anyway, I'm really happy with how it turned out, and I thought I would just tell you a little bit about it. This is a pattern sort of based on the Water Lily, which is a pattern by Megan Fernandez. Um, it's in Pom Pom Quarterly magazine, I'm not sure which issue. But I changed the lace design, and I also made it a deeper V. Um... I knit it from the bottom up and I grafted the I grafted the sleeves together right here. It's still a little bit wet right here. It's mostly dry but it's wet right here because I tried it on and it was pointing out funny so I, I re-wetted that part and because I, I realized I had like pulled it out a little bit too harshly when I was trying to block the lace part. Anyway, so I knit this sort of based on that pattern, but with some adjustments. This is called English Mesh Lace, or Easy English Lace, can't remember. Um, but I just, for this neck part, I just did slip stitches on the right side row of every row. And it just sort of slightly rolls, slightly rolls under, and it just makes kind of a nice edge there. It looks a little bit like an I-cord, which is what I did for the back of the neck. With the water lily, there were some people who were saying that the, the back neck was too floppy. And when I tried mine on too, there was definitely a lot of stitches on this back neck part bef after I had bound off, not bound off, but um, Kitchener stitched the shoulder seams. There were still a lot of stitches on the back neck. So I did some decreases and then I did an I-cord bind off, which you can see there. And it makes it, it's a firm bind off, which I think is ideal for the back of a neck because you don't want it to be flopping down. So this is big enough, the neck opening is big enough, obviously it's a deep V-neck that it fits over my head just fine. So having this section in the back from, you know, only from here to here, being in an I-cord, which is a, a stiffer bind off, is no problem at all. I also did a little, you can't really tell, but right here I did a little bit of crochet to sort of connect from where the I-cord stopped to where started the slip stitches for the front of the v-neck, but Sometimes I do a little bit of crochet if I need like a stiffer reinforced section where I don't want to attach an I-cord because like that was just sort of an in-between space that needed a little bit of reinforcement. So there you can see the lace. And I did a Latvian braid across the back and the front, which is this part here. And yeah. That's it. So I'm pretty happy with how that came out. Uh, it fits. So I will probably wear this next week when it is totally dry. But yeah, and I might as well just show you this now because I have it out. This is what I use to dry my sweaters and projects. We live in a small apartment and we don't have our own laundry room. We share one in the basement with other people who live here. So I can't really leave stuff out in a laundry room to dry. So if I have sweaters, or even, even not hand-knitted things, but things that need to be hand-washed, I wash them in our sink, and then I put them on this to dry. 
which is this one of these like spring things that can compact down to this and then it springs open it's kind of awkward to show you but you can like tighten it so it becomes more rounded or you can lie it flat and it's mesh and what's nice is because it's rounded like you can see it would be this way that's how I have it on the ground but it's rounded so your sweater isn't sitting directly on the ground which makes it so that you can have airflow on both sides of it and things dry really fast. So rather than just, I mean really fast, not really fast, it still takes a while to, for some things to dry when it's humid here, but um, you get good airflow on both sides. So rather than just having a sweater lying flat on a towel or something on the floor or on some flat surface, I put it on that, uh, which just helps it dry faster, I think. So, that's finished. Really happy with it. Oh yeah, I was going to show you one other thing about it. I did a garter stitch selvage seam for the sides. So I knit this piece flat, seamed it up the sides. So I will show you here my seam. So my seam is right here. See where it starts a little bit right there? I'm only being able to find it because I can feel it. You can see it a little bit more there. But it's pretty invisible, if I may say so myself. Which is why I love this, se this seaming method. Uh, on the inside, there is a seam, which you can see. And it's, you know, a little bit thick, but not anything horrible. But I really like using the garter stitch selvage for seaming. And I had a long time ago when I when I started knitting, or whatever, not a long time ago, it wasn't a long time ago, but sometimes when I had used a garter stitch selvage in the past, which means that you knit the first and last stitch of your flat project every row. So even on the purl rows, you knit the first and last stitch. And that gives you, if you have stockinette stitch, it gives you like this little bump, a little purl bump sort of, it's a garter stitch bump on the sides, on both sides. And before what I had done, which never worked, was I had done the garter stitch seam, or I had done the garter stitch selvage, which is that extra stitch. And I never knew how to seam it up. So I thought you were supposed to connect the two little bumps together from one side to the other side. And you have this little bump sticking out on the edge of both sides. And I thought you were somehow just supposed to sew the bumps together. Which is not how you do it. And if you do that, you end up with a really ugly seam that you can see. Uh, I have a really help. Oh, well, it's not my tutorial, but I found a very helpful tutorial on online that is linked in my show notes. It's been linked for the past few weeks with this top, but uh, just to remind you that it's there. And that shows you how to correctly seam together a garter stitch selvage. And basically what's different from other ways of seaming that I've used in the past is that you're looking at your piece from the right side, so you have the right side facing you, Rather than a lot of times when you seam things, you turn it inside out and you seam on the wrong side. But with the right side facing you, and then it shows you where you put your needle and you are like sewing it together in this kind of like secret behind, it's not secret, I don't know why I'm saying that. Uh, you sew it together in a way that it kind of just zoop, zips up almost and then the stitches just come together so nicely. So you have the stitches from like the front and from the back of your piece, whatever, from your two sides of your pieces lying right next to each other. And then you have the little bumps from the garter stitch edge hiding on the inside. So you have two full stitches on the inside and then you get a perfect seam on the outside. So 
If you have problems with seamings or if you would just like to try some different techniques for finishing, especially if you're knitting garments flat or anything if you're knitting it flat and it needs to be seamed together, I would definitely recommend garter stitch salvage. Okay, moving on. Uh, so, upcoming. I told you already that I am going to be knitting another Swedish Spring shawl out of this lovely yarn from Maya at the Wool Barn. This is her silk sock base, and this is the metal colorway. It is 50% superwash merino and 50% silk. It's 400 meters. So this will be perfect for that, which I will probably cast on pretty soon. And then also, I got this last week, which is the scrumptious lace from Fiberspace. And I, this is in color 513. And this is a thousand meters. So originally I was planning on knitting the Pebble Beach shawl because uh, Helen Stewart of the Curious Handmade podcast and the designer of the Pebble Beach shawl is coming out with two new sizes, a medium and a large, and she said that they will, on her most recent podcast, she said that they will probably be released on May 5th. So I thought that would be perfect, and I was planning on knitting that because I have bought that pattern, and it's going to come as just an update to the pattern. You don't have to rebuy it or anything. I have never knit it though. I've been wanting to knit it, but I just haven't. So I was thinking that would be good. But then I'm looking at this and it's lace weight and the pattern is in fingering weight. So it's not really a problem because I was planning on knitting the largest size. So it would still come out quite big. But the other thing is, is that I have 10, not 10,000, did I say that before? I have 1,000 meters of this yarn. And the person who I will be making this shawl for, I think would appreciate a very large shawl that can be worn over the shoulders, not in the front ever, probably. So I'm thinking maybe of skipping the Pebble Beach shawl for now, even though I definitely want to come back to that and I will probably knit it for myself in something else thinking about skipping that for now because Helen said that the, I think the large size will still only take 600 meters or 700 meters or something, I'm not sure exactly on the numbers, but I would have quite a bit of yarn left over and I don't really have a good idea of what to do with leftover lace weight yarn. So instead I'm thinking with this, I might knit a one color lattice, even though this is in fingering weight also. Um, but again, that would kind of leave me with a bit of yarn left over. One thing that I could do would be to double it, so then I would have basically 500 meters. But I've also been looking at the Elizabeth shawl, which is a pattern by D. O'Keefe. And I first saw that shawl on the Mustache podcast. Uh, Stephanie was knitting that on that podcast, and she knit it in a really hot pink, and it was really pretty. But I was thinking that I might be interested in doing that. And basically the Elizabeth shawl in the shawl description says that it's sort of a Shetland lace sampler. And... Um, so I think that could be really interesting because this shawl is sort of inspired, it's definitely inspired by Shetland lace, and I think that I would like to keep going with that a little bit more. Um, so I'm kind of thinking and trying to decide what I'm going to do with that. Also this week, right before I decided to record, I pulled out my trindle, which is a spindle by the Trindle Man on 
Etsy. You can find the links in the show notes. And Kristen from the Volenbein, from Volenbein Yarns and the Yarngasm podcast was spinning on her trindle in her most recent episode. And I have a trindle also. And I haven't used it in a while, so I thought, why not? It's fun. Pull it out. Spin on it a little bit. So I did. So here's my trindle. And right now I have my uh, turquoise arms on here, which I think are a lightweight or medium weight, I can't remember. Um, but you can see this, maybe you can't see it so well, you can, I don't know. This fiber that I spun up on it was a lot of fun to spin, and it is sparkly. You can't see it, but most of the sparkle happened in the middle. And as I was spinning it, and I got to the sparkly part, I was spinning this around, and the sparkles were not only, not just like silver sparkle, which is fun, but it wasn't that. The sparkly parts are in purples and reds, and so they kind of go with this, uh, it's, it's burgundy, bright red, gray, and black in this little bit of fiber that I spun. So I was spinning it around and around and around, and the sparkles were just flashing. It looked like a little sparkler. So that was fun. But this is one pony from... Deb of Fondant Fiber. And Deb was so sweet that she sent me some punis to try out a couple of weeks ago. And these are her hand carded punis, and she gave me the ritzy colorway. And I have them here. I moved them to a little bit of a larger bag just so they could have some room and not get squished. So I just basically took one of these out and spun it. And this is it. So that was a lot of fun. And I posted a picture of this on Instagram and I hashtagged it with bite size spinning because that's kind of what it is. You, you know, you spend half an hour or whatever it is spinning one of these and it's just like a little taste of spinning. And it's fun because they're all different colors and can try it out for a little while. I can see that this one has some gold sparkle in it, so I think that will be a lot of fun to spin. That might be my next one. But when you spin one of these punies, you start from the end and you kind of pull it out like this and you spin from the end. And that's how it works. I don't pre-draft them at all. These were so nice to spin. They just, it was so smooth. I had no problems at all. And I have actually spun with um, Gourmet Stash Poonies as well, and she has a lot of lovely colors, and her poonies are quite difficult to get sometimes. She has updates that go pretty fast, uh, and they're lovely to spin, but I think I prefer these ones from Deb because they are not quite as tightly compacted. Uh, compacted isn't the right word, but they're not quite as tightly wrapped, I guess. And they're easier to spin. And I don't know, I really enjoyed it. So if you are looking to get your hands on some punis and you haven't been able to yet, I would definitely go and check out Deb's shop. Um, when she sent me these, she said I could share with you a coupon code, which in case you didn't get that was uh, more stash. So you can receive 10% off your order with Deb. So go over there and check it out. All right. So this week uh, for question and answer, my question to you guys is, do you knit through the summer or are you a cold weather knitter, I guess you could say, <laughs> or um, do you find yourself gravitating toward other crafts in the summer? I know that it's not summer for everyone. Um, Nina from the Fuzzy Love Knots podcast, for example, I know she is in Chile and she has just shown some 
lovely fall leaves changing colors on her most recent podcast. And of course, Australia is not going into summer. They're all going into fall. But it's spring here and will be summer in a little bit. So my question to you is, and you can answer this obviously if you live in the Southern Hemisphere as well. Um, but yeah, do you knit through the summer? What projects do you gravitate toward during the summer? And if you, if you don't knit, if you do something else, what do you do? Uh, I would love to see any projects that you work on or, um, yeah, where you get your inspiration. Sometimes I find in the summer, even though maybe I want to knit, I'm just too hot and like too, my hands are too sweaty or something. So I have to be like really inspired to knit. So let me know what you guys think. And this week I uh, received sort of, it wasn't a direct question, but Susie in Oregon asked uh, about sweater sizing. And on my last podcast when I talked about my summer top, the blue one that I finished this week, I talked about that I... I think it was that one. It might have been on my gauge episode. I talked about where... I'm going to take this off so I can... I talked about that I measure for my sweaters up in my upper bust. And she said that she had heard that also from somebody else or that they measured right under their bust. So they weren't measuring at their largest point. And I do that because that was a recommendation that I heard on um, from Amy Herzog on her craftsy class, which is called Knit to Flatter, I think. And I've taken that class, and I think that it is a really useful class for sizing. And the thing is, for me, is that the reason why I take my upper bust measurement and she, Amy talks about this in her class as well, is depending on like what size bust you have, that can work for you without too many other modifications. So I don't have a very large bust, so for me to take my upper bust measurement, it is different from my largest point measurement, but I can just get away with doing some simple um, increases and decreases along two points basically. Let me just pull this up and I'll show you. So I'll pull it up a little bit higher, so. Um, but basically, you can't see it so much, but along here, which is like a third, I have it like one third, one third, one third. Sometimes I do quarter, quarter, and then half. Number of stitches is where I place the decreases and increases. So for mine, I just need to do some simple decreases to the waist, knit the waist straight for a little while, and then do some simple increases for the bust to get up to that um, upper bust measurement, which gives me a slightly negative ease at my bust point, so that it's not, which you want a little bit of negative ease sometimes because you don't want it to be like flopping everywhere. <laughs> like Negative ease can be a good thing um, to make something look fitted and not overly fitted but just fit well. Uh, but if you have a larger bust there are some different types of adjustments that you can do including bust darts. I have never had to do bust darts. I don't really require them for my bust size. So uh, <laughs> if you need bust darts then you should probably do them because I think it will help you with your sweater fitting better and you'll be more happy with the result in the end. But basically what a bust dart is, is that you get a little extra fabric. You make a triangle here on the side and you can get some extra fabric that way. That's a, I guess that would be a horizontal bust dart. There can also be vertical bust darts. Um, but if you, if you need to have bust darts, you can I would recommend checking out the Craftsy class, um, Knit to Flatter, because she talks more about the math that you need to do or how you, what 
how you, how you know whether or not you need bust darts, uh, depending on how big of a difference in the size you have in the measurement from your upper bust measurement right under your armpits here to your largest point measurement. So I don't have very much advice on that because I, I don't have experience with it. But um, I am a Craftsy affiliate, so if you click on the Craftsy link on my blog, then I will receive a small commission for that. Um, but I always say this because I only share this the classes that I find helpful and um, that I think will help you as well. So, Susie, that would be my advice to you. Um, Amy Herzog has a lot of information about sizing on her blog as well, so you could check that out. And her Make Wear Love, um, no, Custom Fit is her pattern designing template sort of thing, software. It's like a sweater generator, basically. And that would be another way if you want to basically knit a sweater that will fit you, is to check that out. Um, but her blog is Make Wear Love, I think. So she might have some more tips for you if you have a larger bust that you need to accommodate in your knitted fabric. So I think that is it for this week. I will see you in about a week and um, I hope you have some nice weather wherever you are and that you are enjoying the beginning of spring or the beginning of fall and um, happy knitting. Bye.